June 12, Ben Haydad's second attack. After their defeat, Ben Hadad's officer said to him, The Israelite gods are gods of the hills. That is why they won. But we can beat them easily on the plains. Only this time replace the kings with field commanders. Recruit another army like the one you lost. Give us the same number of horses, chariots, and men, and we will fight against them on the plains. There is no doubt that we will beat them. So King Ben Hadad did as they suggested. The following spring, he called up the Aramean army and marched out against Israel, this time at Aphek. Israel then mustered its army, set up supply lines, and marched out for battle. But the Israelite army looked like two little flocks of goats in comparison to the vast Aramean forces that filled the countryside. Then the man of God went to the king of Israel and said, This is what the Lord says. The Arameans have said, The Lord is a God of the hills and not of the plains. So I will defeat this vast army for you. Then you will know that I am the Lord. The two armies camped opposite each other for seven days. And on the seventh day, the battle began. The Israelites killed 100,000 Aramean foot soldiers in one day. The rest fled into the town of Aphek, but the wall fell on them and killed another 27,000. Ben-Hadad fled into the town and hid in a secret room. Ben-Hadad's officers said to him, Sir, we have heard that the kings of Israel are merciful, so let's humble ourselves by wearing burlap around our waists and putting ropes on our heads and surrender to the king of Israel. Then perhaps he will let you live. So they put on burlap and ropes, and they went to the king of Israel and begged, Your servant Ben-Hadad says, Please let me live. The king of Israel responded, Is he still alive? He is my brother. The men took this as a good sign and quickly picked up on his words. Yes, they said, your brother Ben-Hadad. Go and get him, the king of Israel told them. And when Ben-Hadad arrived, Ahab invited him up into his chariot. Ben-Hadad told him, I will give back the towns my father took from your father, and you may establish places of trade in Damascus as my father did in Samaria. Then Ahab said, I will release you under these conditions. So they made a new treaty, and Ben-Hadad was set free. A prophet condemns Ahab. Meanwhile, the Lord instructed one of the group of prophets to say to another man, Hit me! But the man refused to hit the prophet. Then the prophet told him, Because you have not obeyed the voice of the Lord, a lion will kill you as soon as you leave me. And when he had gone, a lion did attack and kill him. Then the prophet turned to another man and said, Hit me! So he struck the prophet and wounded him. The prophet placed a bandage over his eyes to disguise himself and then waited beside the road for the king. As the king passed by, the prophet called out to him, Sir, I was in the thick of battle and suddenly a man brought me a prisoner. He said, Guard this man. If for any reason he gets away, you will either die or pay a fine of 75 pounds of silver. But while I was busy doing something else, the prisoner disappeared. Well, it's your own fault. The king replied, You have brought the judgment on yourself. Then the prophet quickly pulled the bandage from his eyes, and the king of Israel recognized him as one of the prophets. The prophet said to him, This is what the Lord says, Because you have spared the man I said must be destroyed, now you must die in his place, and your people will die instead of his people. So the king of Israel went home to Samaria angry and sullen. Naboth's Vineyard Now there was a man named Naboth from Jezreel who owned a vineyard in Jezreel beside the palace of King Ahab of Samaria. One day Ahab said to Naboth, Since your vineyard is so convenient to my palace, I would like to buy it to use as a vegetable garden. I will give you a better vineyard in exchange, or if you prefer, I will pay you for it. But Naboth replied, The Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance that was passed down by my ancestors. So Ahab went home angry and sullen because of Naboth's answer. The king went to bed with his face to the wall and refused to eat. What's the matter? his wife Jezebel asked him. What's made you so upset that you're not eating? I asked Naboth to sell me his vineyard or trade it, but he refused, Ahab told her. Are you the king of Israel or not? Jezebel demanded. Get up and eat something and don't worry about it. I'll get you Naboth's vineyard. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name, sealed them with his seal, and sent them to the elders and other leaders of the town where Naboth lived. In her letters, she commanded, Call the citizens together for fasting and prayer, and give Naboth a place of honor. 
and then seat two scoundrels across from him who will accuse him of cursing God and the king, then take him out and stone him to death. So the elders and other town leaders followed the instructions Jezebel had written in the letters. They called for a fast and put Naboth at a prominent place before the people. Then the two scoundrels came and sat down across from him, and they accused Naboth before all the people, saying, He cursed God and the king. So he was dragged outside the town and stoned to death. The town leaders then sent word to Jezebel, Naboth has been stoned to death. When Jezebel heard the news, she said to Ahab, You know the vineyard Naboth wouldn't sell you? Well, you can have it now. He's dead. So Ahab immediately went down to the vineyard of Naboth to claim it. But the Lord said to Elijah, Go down to meet King Ahab of Israel, who rules in Samaria. He will be at Naboth's vineyard in Jezreel, claiming it for himself. Give him this message. This is what the Lord says. Wasn't it enough that you killed Naboth? Must you rob him too? Because you have done this, dogs will lick your blood at the very place where they licked the blood of Naboth. So, my enemy, you have found me, Ahab exclaimed to Elijah. Yes, Elijah answered, I have come because you have sold yourself to what is evil in the Lord's sight. So now the Lord says, I will bring disaster on you and consume you. I will destroy every one of your male descendants, slave and free alike, anywhere in Israel. I am going to destroy your family as I did the family of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, and the family of Baasha, son of Ahijah. For you have made me very angry and have led Israel into sin. And regarding Jezebel, the Lord says, Dogs will eat Jezebel's body at the plot of land in Jezreel. The members of Ahab's family who die in the city will be eaten by dogs, and those who die in the field will be eaten by vultures. No one else so completely sold himself to what was evil in the Lord's sight as Ahab did under the influence of his wife Jezebel. His worst outrage was worshipping idols just as the Amorites had done, the people whom the Lord had driven out from the land ahead of the Israelites. But when Ahab heard this message, he tore his clothing, dressed in burlap, and fasted. He even slept in burlap and went about in deep mourning. Then another message from the Lord came to Elijah. Do you see how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has done this, I will not do what I promised during his lifetime. It will happen to his sons. I will destroy his dynasty. Jehoshaphat and Ahab For three years there was no war between Aram and Israel. Then during the third year King Jehoshaphat of Judah went to visit King Ahab of Israel. During the visit the king of Israel said to his officials, Do you realize that the town of Ramoth-Gilead belongs to us, and yet we've done nothing to recapture it from the king of Aram? Then he turned to Jehoshaphat and asked, Will you join me in battle to recover Ramoth-Gilead? Jehoshaphat replied to the king of Israel, Why, of course, you and I are as one. My troops are your troops, and my horses are your horses. Then Jehoshaphat added, But first let's find out what the Lord says. So the king of Israel summoned the prophets, about four hundred of them, and asked them, Should I go to war against Ramoth Gilead, or should I hold back? They all replied, Yes, go right ahead. The Lord will give the king victory. But Jehoshaphat asked, Is there not also a prophet of the Lord here? We should ask him the same question. The king of Israel replied to Jehoshaphat, There is one more man who could consult the Lord for us, but I hate him. He never prophesies anything but trouble for me. His name is Micaiah, son of Imlah. Jehoshaphat replied, That's not the way a king should talk. Let's hear what he has to say. So the king of Israel called one of his officials and said, Quick, bring Micaiah, son of Imlah. From Second Chronicles Jehoshaphat enjoyed great riches and high esteem, and he made an alliance with Ahab of Israel by having his son marry Ahab's daughter. A few years later, he went to Samaria to visit Ahab, who prepared a great banquet for him and his officials. They butchered great numbers of sheep, goats, and cattle for the feast. Then Ahab enticed Jehoshaphat to join forces with him to recover Ramoth-Gilead. Will you go with me to Ramoth Gilead? King Ahab of Israel asked King Jehoshaphat of Judah. Jehoshaphat replied, Why, of course, you and I are as one, and my troops are your troops. We will certainly join you in battle. Then Jehoshaphat added, But first, let's find out what the Lord says. So the king of Israel summoned the prophets. 
400 of them, and asked them, Should we go to war against Ramoth Gilead, or should I hold back? They all replied, Yes, go right ahead. God will give the king victory. But Jehoshaphat asked, Is there not also a prophet of the Lord here? We should ask him the same question. The king of Israel replied to Jehoshaphat, There is one more man who could consult the Lord for us, but I hate him. He never prophesies anything but trouble for me. His name is Micaiah, son of Imlah. Jehoshaphat replied, That's not the way a king should talk. Let's hear what he has to say. So the king of Israel called one of his officials and said, Quick, bring Micaiah, son of Imlah. 